Hi everyone, it is Mr. Moreau here with a little intro lecture on the principle of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Now, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is an idea that is going to allow us to uh, calculate, therefore observe, and conclude whether or not evolution actually has occurred over time. Now that may sound like an easy thing to observe and conclude, however remember that very often evolution takes many many years over many many generations, so it's not often that a human can actually observe evolution occurring uh, within another population in their own lifetime. Only in rare instances where let's say we're observing bacterial colonies, uh, because bacteria have such a short generation time, it allows us to observe evolution happening from generation to generation. But in uh, you know, a larger mammal, for example, uh, we're not going to be able to really observe evolution um, as easily as that bacteria example. So for that reason, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium principle exists in order for us to calculate uh, allele, frequencies, uh, allele frequencies before and after uh, a certain amount of time. Now, in order for a uh, population to be in equilibrium, that means it is not evolving. Okay, so for no evolution, evolution to occur, that means it cannot uh, be subject to any of those mechanisms of evolution that we discussed before. So the criteria for no evolution to be occurring means that there is no mutation that is entering the gene pool of this population. That means there is no migration neither in nor out of this population because again, like we talked about with gene flow, that could affect the frequencies of certain alleles, therefore certain traits present in the gene pool. We can have no non-random mating. That's kind of a weird double negative phrasing, but it basically just means that sexual selection cannot be acting here. Every trait needs to have its own, uh, or should I say equal, reproductive advantage. Okay, we have a level playing field there. Uh, for that reason, we also must assume that there is no survival advantage. In other words, natural selection is not really a thing in this population. Okay, it's an equal playing field in terms of survival advantage as well. And finally, uh, we want to assume or we need to uh, require that there is a large population size. That is the case because a small population is more vulnerable to genetic drift. Remember, the mechanism of evolution that is genetic drift is one that occurs due to random chance. A common example we use for that is when, let's say, an anthill gets stepped on randomly uh, by a passerby. There's no survival advantage of which ant got uh, stepped on and which one didn't. It was a completely random luck event. Okay, it was random chance. So uh, a small population is more vulnerable or will be affected more by uh, chance events. So that's why we want a large population size because that prevents a major effect from occurring due to chance. So as you can see, these criteria in order for a population to be in equilibrium really parallels closely those mechanisms of evolution that we've discussed uh, previously. And here is the actual principle of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. There are two equations here, and these two equations are going to allow us to uh, algebraically and uh, um, mathematically represent frequencies of alleles and genotypes such that we can follow them through population over time. Okay, The first equation is P plus Q equals 1, where P represents the uh, frequency of the dominant allele. Okay, P represents the frequency of the dominant allele. Frequency, again, just a fancy word for the decimal form of a percentage. If uh, the percentage is 25%, the frequency would be 0 0.25. Okay, it's the decimal form of the percent. Now, Q, therefore, is the frequency of the recessive allele. So it makes sense, uh, you know, since we know that a gene has uh, two alleles, let's say the gene for human eye color, big B versus little b, uh, half of the gene pool, or I'm sorry, uh, a certain percentage of the gene pool is going to be made up of the dominant allele big B, and a certain percent of the gene pool is going to be made up of the uh, recessive allele, in this case little b. Now if we were to um, expand this equation out, we can also come up with another one, and the second equation for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1, where 
Q squared, I'm sorry, P squared is the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype. Going back to our human eye color example, that would be the big B, big B genotype, both of them put together. To, uh, let's go over to Q squared here. Q squared would be the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype, that would be like little b, little b. And then of course 2PQ would be the frequency of the heterozygous genotype, like big B, little b. So now that we know that these equations are uh, mathematically true, we can uh, start to make sense of what the allele frequencies are before and after a given amount of time. Because uh, this, these equations are going to give us a mathematical snapshot of any population at one given instance. Okay? However, um, that really is kind of useless for us unless we, we go back to that population later and do that same calculation to see if our numbers have changed over time. Because evolution, in its simplest definition, is just a change in allele frequency over time. So if we have concluded, uh, or rather calculated, that the frequency of alleles or frequency of certain genotypes has changed over time, then we are able to actually uh, not just observe but conclude, based on our mathematical uh, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium principle, that evolution has in fact occurred over that given amount of time between our calculations. Let's do a sample together. I have a rather creepy looking population here, and that is going to be our initial population. Okay, so as you can see, I've got uh, 20 individuals in this population, and I have uh, most of them uh, with brown eyes and some of them with blue eyes. Now, if you observe this population, just from uh, a quick glance, you cannot determine how many individuals are homozygous dominant and how many individuals are heterozygous because as you know both of those genotypes result in the same phenotype however what you can determine is the number of individuals or the frequency of individuals that has the homozygous recessive genotype because that means they have the recessive phenotype and that is in fact an observable um, uh, calculation. Okay, So we always start with the frequency of individuals that express the homozygous recessive phenotype, therefore the homozygous recessive genotype. And as our equation above shows, that is Q squared. Q squared is always the variable that we are going to start with. So Q squared in this case is equal to 4 out of 20 individuals and 4 divided by 20 comes out to 0 0.2. I just figured out Q squared. If I know Q squared, it should be easy for me to calculate Q, and I'll do that next. It's simply the square root of Q squared, right? Q squared, the square root of that is Q. So Q is the square root of 0 0.2, which is 0.45. Rounding to two decimal points is just fine throughout all of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. If I know uh, Q, then I can figure out P because I know the equation, uh, as seen above, P plus Q equals one. So that allows me to get to my next um, variable there. So P is one minus 0.45 equals 0.55. If I know P, I can very easily get P squared, and that is going to be seen here. P squared is 0.55 squared, which is 0.3. And if I know all of these, then I can finally calculate 2PQ, which is the frequency of individuals with the hetero, uh, heterozygous genotype, and that is seen here. Sorry, I'm trying to get rid of my um, highlight there. Get that back. There we go. Uh, and that is our uh, entire set of calculations. So we now have uh, P and Q the frequency of the dominant allele and recessive allele. We have P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared, which is the homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive genotypes, respectively. So there's our mathematical snapshot of this original population. But what if we scooch ahead and look at the same population later on? Okay, now this is meant to represent the same population, but I come back, uh, you know, a certain amount of time later, and I'm going to redo the same calculations as I did before, okay? So that should be no surprise how we get from Q squared 
Um, do that again. Uh, Q squared uh, is five blue-eyed individuals, those individuals expressing the homozygous recessive genotype. That comes out to be 0.17. That allows me to calculate Q. Therefore, I can get to P, which allows me to calculate P squared. Finally, 2PQ. And now, with all of this, I can now get my yellow highlight back, uh, do a comparison. So if I take a before and after, okay, my mathematical snapshot before and after this time has passed, I can see that these allele frequencies have changed, okay? It appears as though uh, the frequency of individuals with blue eyes has decreased over time. 20% of the population initially had blue eyes, but now only 17% of them have blue eyes. So there is one example. I can do that kind of a you know before and after comparison with every single one of these variable calculations, but that is the type of calculation we can do to see whether or not this population is evolving. Because I do, in fact, see that these numbers have changed over time, I can now start to make inferences to explain why this population has changed over time. Perhaps I can see that well, this population is a little bit bigger. I mean, that happens from time to time, right? Populations go up and down in size. That's nothing to freak out about. But maybe um, some inward migration, which would be gene flow, has caused this population to change over time. Perhaps there is a reproductive advantage to brown eyes. Perhaps there is a survival advantage to brown eyes. Perhaps, uh, well, we don't really see a mutation here, so that would be um, not a wise inference to make. But you can see how I can, first of all, mathematically show that evolution has occurred and then start to infer what changes must have occurred, what, uh, which mechanisms of evolution could be acting on this population. And that's what allows us to say with confidence that this population is or is not changing over time, which could lead us into our inferences. And that there is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you later.